comes in. They are coming in right now. Great. Will I be able to see how many people are on or will we? Michael just responded to your question, Lynn, in the chat. Okay. Okay, welcome everyone, and thank you for coming to the CEO panel and Ask the CEO. We have four wonderful CEOs with us today, but before we get started, I just want to take care of some business, and before we let them introduce their um, fantastic selves, we are going to, um, if you have any questions, this site, this um, session will really depend on the questions that you ask. They're all smiling at me because I'm complimenting them. Um, in the chat box, if you don't mind putting your questions in there. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, it depends on uh, how fun this activity is and session will be based on the questions that you choose to ask. I do have some backups in case um, the group goes quiet. So we're going to start off by letting, um, we have Angela Howard, Chris Silkop. Jason Hagensick and Scott Goyer. So we're gonna start in alphabetical order to make it fair, because um, I know some of these guys are competitive. Um, Angela Howard comes from us from the YMCA of North Central Florida, um, better known as Gatorland or Gainesville. Angela, will you tell us a little bit about yourself and then also kind of your favorite leadership book? Yes, first I wanna say thank you. It's an honor to be here today um, in this conference and participating with this panel. Um, my name is Angela Howard. I've been with the Y for 16 years. And um, my favorite book is Jim Collins, Good to Great. Great, thank you, Angela. And now we're gonna to go to Chris Silkop who joins us from Felicia Flagler Family YMCA where high speeds are a normal thing, being in Daytona and Daltona beaches. So tell us about Chris and your favorite leadership book. <laughs> Hello, I'm Chris Silkop uh, from a land of high speed. Um, <laughs> my, actually, my favorite leadership book, I have two books, is actually uh, The Leadership Challenge. It's a very dry read, actually, but it's a very thorough book and a, uh, Plant manager from, from Dow gave me that when I was in Texas during my career. But my best supervision book, though, I highly recommend for supervisors is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Very old book, but I'll tell you what, when it comes to supervision, I recommend it. It has a lot of good stories in it. That's why I like it. Nice. And then, Chris, tell us a little bit. How long have you been with the Y? Been with the Y 25 years. Um, 18 of those years has been in Florida. I was with this association, left in Texas. I was the CEO of an association in Texas, South Texas, for seven years. Came back to the same association. Nice. Thank you, Chris. Jason Hagensick from the wonderful South Palm Beach, YMCA at South Palm Beach, who's also our volunteer leader and chairman of the board of directors for the State Alliance of YMCA's of Florida. So. Jason, tell us a little bit about your journey and then your favorite leadership book. Sure, and good morning to everybody. I guess it's a good day. Any day that I get to go before Scott Goyer is a win. So I'm, uh, I'm happy to be in this seat. Uh, again, Jason Hagensick, President and CEO of the YMC of South Palm Beach County. I'm celebrating 30 years in the YMCA movement. I started my career in Corpus Christi, Texas. I met my wife at the YMCA in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we then moved to Southern California where we spent 14 years uh, before I joined the national staff. Uh, and I was with the YMCA of the USA for four years before accepting the position here in uh, Boca Raton and the YMCA of South Palm Beach County. And my, um, my go-to book 
uh, is actually the C in YMCA, uh, which is a gift that's often given out with the YMCA of Long Beach in California. And uh, I probably reference this more than any other book that I have without question. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jason. And I appreciate um, your partnership that we have. I'm the CEO of the Florida State Alliance and he is my partner um, as my, my governance chair so and the chairman of the board, so thank you. And then last but not least, we have uh, on his way, that's why he's in the car, he's taking his time out of his personal time to join us because he's technically on PTO. Um, from the wine save the sun coast where you know the the beaches are beautiful in Clearwater. Um, we have Scott Goyer, who is also our public policy chair for the Florida State Alliance and our former treasurer. So without ado, Scott, tell us a little bit about yourself and your favorite uh, book. Uh, you froze a little bit for us. So. And my 40th year. Oh, come on now. Better? <clears throat> As I come up a mountain, and where I uh, uh, 20 years as the CEO of the YMCA Suncoast, my favorite book is Five Temptations of a CEO by Patrick Lencioni. Uh, I think that that probably, um, if you're going to be a CEO, it's a book you need to read. It's a fable story book, and I one of my favorites. Nice. And you broke up a little bit, Scott, but Scott had mentioned that he's been with the Y. Is that 40 years, I heard you say? Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. So now we're going to go to open questions. But to get us started on those questions, I just wanted to see, you know, what was each one of yours journey to get to where you are today? Take about a minute or two and think about that on you know, what motivated you to get where you're at today, if you don't mind? Think about it for a second. And then Chris, let's start with you. Um, honestly, I wanted to be the, uh, um, I want to have a decision in my own future. So I want to be a CEO because I wanted, I want to have my future in my own hands and the decisions that I make. Combined with, of course, wanting to do the most good for the most people. Um, but that's kind of what, what drove me was, honestly, I had some pretty poor supervisors, I'll be honest, early in my, my career. And, and I, I already said that if you, uh, uh, smart people learn from their mistakes, brilliant people learn from other people's mistakes. So a lot of things I learned, I learned from them of what they did wrong, make sure I wouldn't do that in, in the future um, as, a, as a CEO. But um, again, just wanting to be in command of my own future is, is what, what Joe drove me. Nice. Thanks for mentioning that, Chris, because it's funny in the previous session, Dr. Shirley Davis said that too, that she had more poor leaders than she did good leaders. So it sounds like that drove you as well. So, you know, Angela, what, was, what motivated you to get where you're at today? Um, I will say it is making a greater impact. I wanted to serve more. I wanted to do more innovative, creative type of ideas. Um, but I knew in order to do that, I had to be the leader who made the decisions. And much like Chris, I learned a lot along my various and diverse journey along my way. I've had numerous various experiences in life uh, before even coming to the YMCA. And I learned from every supervisor that I had. And I had a lot of supervisors that I said, no, that's not how I want to be. So in order to know, to make sure I can make a greater impact um, in the community that I serve, I had to be in a seat of influence to be able to make those decisions. Nice, thanks, Angela. Jason, what about you? fell in love with the YMCA because of the people. Um, and at 19 years old, fresh out of high school, just starting college, I find myself at the YMCA in Corpus Christi. And, and I liked, as an employee of the Y, I liked being friends with the mayor, friends with the chief of police. I enjoyed 
playing basketball with the CEO of, you know, various companies. And as a 19 year old kid, I just didn't have a lot of opportunities to do that in other positions. So I, I, uh, I love the people in the why. I certainly love uh, the programs, but uh, I didn't initially see it as a career. So I started you know, at the front desk folding towels and breaking up fights on the weekend at the YMCA. And when I graduated college, I had a degree in art. And at that time, I'd already worked for the YMCA for a number of years. And I said, well, this is what I enjoy doing. So I got out the national vacancy list, which was published on a yellow, well, we printed it on a yellow piece of paper. I don't know if it was published on a yellow piece of paper. And I applied for a job in Everett, Washington, didn't get it. Applied for a job in Tempe, Arizona, didn't get it. Applied for a job in Laguna Niguel, California. I had no interest in the job in Laguna Niguel, California, but I did the interview because I figured it would be good for me to go through the interview process in California. As a Texan, that just was, I had no interest in California. I got that job and I spent you know, 14 years out there. And I think for me, it's always been aspiring for the growth. You know, I was front desk, then I became a program director, associate executive director, uh, executive director, chief operating officer, CEO, uh, then to the national staff, and then back to the CEO rank. So, but I love the people. The people, and it sounds like what was driving you is just the inspired to grow. That's what I heard you say. Well, and, and I get into, I certainly love the mission of the YMCA it's from the, the book. So like Angela, being in a position of influence and leadership gives you a, a you know, more, a greater ability to influence the quality in your community and the health of your community and staffing. And I've always been, if I'm going to be on a team, I want to be the captain. Uh, that's kind of my, my personality. Nice. Thanks. And last but not least, Scott Goyer, what, what motivated you to get where you're at today? Um, so can you, A, can you hear me okay? I see yeah. I have enough bars, so good. Uh, so uh, unique in some way, shape, or form as a junior in high school, I kind of made a commitment I was going to join the Y. I, I watched my father, who was a, a career Y person, and um, at his going away party in a community of 50,000 people, there were over 1,000 people there saying goodbye to him uh, to move on to another career. And I was like, that's pretty cool to see that one person can have that level of um, I guess, community-wide input and, and uh, impact. And then as I learned more, obviously, about the why and what it can make a difference in a community, I really felt that that was where I wanted to be. I wanted to be with people. I want to work with people. I want to work with kids. Didn't want to be a gym teacher my whole life. And uh, thought that uh, the why could be a great way of being able to fulfill that uh, desire to be engaged and involved in a community. And uh, I like Jason, I think what's cool about these roles is that um, it does put you in um, an almost an automatic entree into the leaders of your community. Uh, the Y has got a great name and it makes a big difference. And I really can't think of another organization that makes as big a difference in a community as the YMCA. Yeah, thank you, Scott. So I'm gonna stick with you for a minute, Scott, since I know you're bar you got enough bars. So. <laughs> What is one thing you would have done differently? Yeah, I saw that as one of the questions you asked, Landon. It wasn't one that I highlighted. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I don't know that. No, no. It's, it's, it's part of it is I don't know that I would have done anything differently. I think that God has really uh, guided me everywhere. I think there's been times that I've left YMCA jobs probably earlier than I probably should have for the, for the Y itself, but it probably from my career, it was a, a great move. Um, I wanted to, to, to be in a couple of community long enough so my kids could have roots. And so I have two daughters and they both kind of graduated from the same high school. I didn't, I went to two different high schools because of my wide career. So I, I wanted to, uh, to have that. So I don't necessarily know that there's anything that would necessarily change. There's a lot of decisions that I make that now with looking back on them, uh, would I've done them differently? Sure. But that's, you know, all of us can say that from that, from that standpoint, but, um, uh, I, I believe, again, God's kind of guided my path throughout this uh, journey, and it's one that I, I, I don't have any real regrets or even ones that I would say that, hey, there's one thing I would do different. Nice. Thanks, Scott. And Chris, what would, is there anything you would have done differently in your career or that you've done? 
Yeah, Scott Scott was right about God got in your career, but there is one thing that I look back that was a major influence or turning point in my career that I think back, you know, maybe I maybe I should have taken that phone call and and, and there's been times where I've actually um, I've act, I think I've kind of delayed my career advance because I stayed at a while longer because I was in the middle of some pro projects. Um, but the one thing was um, a phone call I got years ago when I was the interim CEO here uh, about merging this YMCA with what solution with Daytona. And I went ahead and, and I took the phone call from the board chair of Daytona and I hooked him up with my board chair. And eventually we did merge the two wives, but it was, it had an adverse effect on my career. So because of that, I ended up being a CEO in South Texas, which was good. I mean, I learned how skills, but it was hard on my family. It was very hard on my, my, my kids. I had to pull them out and bring them to Texas and they didn't adapt well to it. So it was a very, they had a hard time with it. But as I look back, I think it was good for me as a career growth, but a lot of pain involved with it, leaving the association that I had been with my entire career. And, and um, it, was a, it was a very personally painful time. Career-wise, it was a painful time. The experience was a very painful experience, but I've grown from it. But since I think back, you know, maybe I should have taken that phone call and not merged the two associations <laughs> and saved me a whole lot of trouble. Well, Chris, thank you for your vulnerability and sharing that. That's incredible. I appreciate that. Jason, you are next. Is there anything you would have done differently? So I have a habit throughout my career when somebody in a position of authority asks me for my opinion, uh, I'm sometimes dumb enough to give it to them. Um, so, you know, just I guess if there's any advice that I would give others is, um, you know, recognize the situation that you find yourself in at, at all times uh, and, and just use your brain and, and I don't want to say that I didn't but uh, I would say that I am willing to give my opinion when asked for it uh, so that can be be dangerous I think you know things that I, I wish I would have maybe done differently um, I'll be on a, a, a funny side um, I uh, asked a donor because of the circumstances we were in, I asked a donor for a 1.3 million dollar gift uh, but I only gave him 24 hours to give me a response uh, because of the situation mm -hmm. we were in. And I wish I would have had 48 hours because that was basically uh, what they indicated is they wanted to support the why they just couldn't in the amount of time that they were given and, and the deal fell through at the last minute. So I'll, I'll stick with that one. <laughs> hey, hey, Jason, if I can ch try to chime in on that. I didn't know as a CEO, you were even allowed an opinion. I think yeah. that's one of the things that I have found as a CEO that once you become CEO, you're no longer allowed an opinion because the minute you say something, it's taken as gospel. So you can't say, you know, anything other than say, folks, this is just my opinion. It's nothing. But I, I've always thought that as a CEO, you're no longer allowed an opinion. Fair enough. <laughs> Good point, Scott. And I have uh, learned that myself in the last year or two. <laughs> Angela, what would you have done differently? Um. I'm trying to think um, every experience that I have had in my life has been training grounds for me. It has been my development to, to get me to where I'm at now. Probably the only thing I would probably change is I was in an association for a long period of time. It was the only association that I was in in the Y before moving from Ohio to come to Gainesville, Florida. And I probably would have went out and explored um, other associations and other states to learn more what other wise do um, and learn about other communities because I'm one who used to travel quite a bit. So I was always around people, learning about people. That would probably be the one thing I changed was not being in the same association for so long and getting out to other YMCAs and experiencing different communities. Nice, and I, I see Jason and Scott's heads both not nodding yes <laughs> on that. So I think that's a really, that's good advice. And, and I think something that um, the folks on this, um, the other three CEOs have shared that they did, they jumped around and learned some new areas. So thanks, Angela. 
So now we're going to get a little bit in the risky side of it. Would you share one of the biggest risks that you've ever taken? And let's see, let's start with Jason this time. So I would, I don't know how my staff would, uh, would describe my risk taking. I, I would say that uh, I always want to be pushing the envelope and, and not necessarily risk, but innovation. Uh, I think that's important for YMCA's uh, to, to continue to stay innovative and take appropriate risk. Uh, and when I was the CEO in Long Beach, California, we had a strategic plan that was adopted and was, was ready to go, but it called for us making investments in six YMCAs on a smaller scale. And uh, when I became the CEO, I went to our board and said, I don't think this is the best way for us to move forward with our assets and, and in prioritizing our projects. So we started a, a quick process to really take a look at all of our facilities and assets um, and prioritize them. And what actually came out of it is we ended up selling our downtown YMCA, which when I became the CEO, I said, the one thing I don't want to do is close or sell a downtown Y. And that was ultimately the decision that we made. Uh, it was the right decision. And, and history has proven that it was the right decision. But it was still unbelievably difficult to make that kind of decision because of the, the volunteers that had gone into it, the amount of community support that had gone into it. Um, but that would be uh, the biggest risk. And uh, fortunately for the YMCA Greater Long Beach, it was it, it, it was the right decision to make. Nice. Um, what about you, Angela? I think I may know what yours is, but I may not. Go ahead. <laughs> you probably do. To be honest with you, the biggest risk I have ever taken in my life is when I accepted the position as the president and CEO of our YMCA here in Gaines, so at the North Central Florida Y. Um, as mentioned, I had been in one association for a long period of time, and then um, I stepped out and took on a role in a YMCA that is really a turnaround situation. We have been um, working to rebuild this Y, and I've been there now just um, January would be two years. So that was probably the biggest risk I have ever taken in my life is to step out and, and come to a turnaround Y. Um, but I was just crazy enough um, to believe that, you know, this why had been around forever and the community was, is awesome. And it, the community stepped in when it needed it the most. So for in my mind, I said, you know what? I just believe that we can turn this why around and it will be in this community for another 50 years. So that was probably the biggest risk is leaving somewhere that I was completely stable and uh, leaving a, a state that I've been in for a while to basically come to the unknown. But <laughs> I love every bit of it. It's been a crazy journey thus far, but amazing staff. We have been having a blast in spite of the challenges. <laughs> Well, I can tell you that Gainesville and the Y is, and we in Florida are much fortunate to have you in our, our realm. So thank you. That's great. Scott, what about you? So I was, I was puzzling here to think about risk and um, it, it's interesting because I don't necessarily know that I've thought of everything we've done as risk. I it have, it tends to be risk adverse, which means I do my homework a lot before we make any commitments or I make any commitment. I'd say probably the one career-wise, um, two times. So one time I would just started my Y career and someone said, hey, you want to start a YMCA up in a neighboring community and from scratch and not understanding that. And just recently married my wife of over 35 years and uh, in driving Parker right now and uh, just said, sure, what the heck. But I think the, probably the greatest risk is uh, we, the, the YMCA of Middle Tennessee, Nashville, was awarded an MRC role, a Management Resource Center, which is an, was an arm of the YMCA of the USA. And it was the first one in the South. And uh, I was running one of their larger branches at the time and Clark Baker came to me and I said, the, I think the risk I took is I said no twice to that job. And until the third uh, time that he sent my dad after me to recruit me to say, you need to go do this. 
And I said, I'm not ready to leave the branch yet. And so the risk was, is I became an MRC director and I ran a branch of the YMCA of Middle Tennessee. And we had our second daughter all through that same period of time. So uh, it was uh, it was kind of an interesting uh, time to, to actually do two, jo two jobs at once and only get paid for one, which was a brilliant move on, by Clark Baker. So that was pretty good. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. What about you, Chris? Biggest risk you've taken? Oh, uh, I think <laughs> it's quite current. Um, my current situation, uh, dealing with a third party. Um, we, our YMCA is neck deep. Or we're over leveraged, I would say, in third party memberships, uh, more than in the wider state. And, and, um, and I'm, I'm going to go do a model where I'm going to charge third party people $20 to come into the YMCA to use anything outside of the fitness center. And, and I, I don't know how that's going to work out. It's it's um, it's an unknown, uncharted territory. And when 60% uh, of our membership base is third party, it's it's going to be it'll be a wild card. So that currently that's the biggest risk I think I'm taking. But other than that, moving to Texas, taking on the CEO role again of a YMCA struggling of uh, YMCA Golden Crescent in between Houston and Corpus, and and uh, we we did a project in a small town called um, Port Lavaca where we had land already bought. We sold the land for $200,000. Uh, and it was supposed to be for a, a new branch and we were leasing space at the time at a storefront. And we turned around and used that $200,000 down payment on a shopping center and actually purchased the entire shopping center. And we ended up putting a YMCA in the shopping center where Walmart was. But now we were we owned a shopping plaza with, with a tractor supply and three or four of the tenants. And, sold off parcels of it for fast food restaurants. And now I'm in the for-profit land of, of being a, a, a landlord. So that, that was a risk that was unusual for the YMCA to take. It ended up working out beautifully through the Y. And then we went to 24 hours operation. That was another risk that we, we took and it ended up working out in that situation. So those are probably the, the biggest risks. Um, and then we ended up turning that association around and now they're doing very, very well. But when I got there, they, they were probably one, two years away from closing their, their doors. Wow. Well, those are some big risks. And now from listening to you all throughout the questions that you've already asked, the next question, some folks may have picked up on kind of what your leadership style is. So can each one of you kind of describe on what you think your leadership style is? Let's start with Angela this time. Um, I'm probably a, a crossover um, from a transformational to a servant type of leadership with a hint of charismatic linked into it. So that's <laughs> homework for those who study leadership styles. <laughs> so I, I'm a little mixture because I'm just used to getting in and getting things done. Um, but at the same time, I, I can delegate, um, but I believe in team. I believe in everyone um, having a voice um, as we move forward within our communities and uh, working together as a team because there's no I in team. Yes, I may be the CEO, but we have, we're all together as one family working for our community. So I have like a mixture of three different styles. Nice, thanks. Scott, what about you? I'm not going to get as ethereal as Angela. I can't even tell you if it's transformation, transformational or not. So I'll have to read that book, Angela. So I apologize. Uh, I, I, I think it's it's shared. I, I, I am by nature afraid of making a bad decision. And I think that's collectively many of us in this roles. We live in some of those fear states. So I don't make a decision in a void. Uh, we, we the decision making process or how I lead is, is that you know we as a group and the people I surround myself uh, all have input. I, ultimately, I understand I have a final say, but I would say from a leadership perspective, uh, it's an, I would try and do is what I would call an engaged leadership. Uh, and when I talk to anyone at our offices when they come and interview for a job that may be in our association, I would say each one of us has a job to do. And at times your job is gonna be more important than mine. Uh, just because I have the title, I understand that that carries with it some weight, but um, I think I would say it's probably shared, it's a shared leadership style 
uh, and some of that is motivated on and if I'm going down, we're all going down. Nice. <laughs> what about you, Chris? Um, yeah, I like to get all the input. Scott's right about not making a decision to avoid. Uh, my staff is probably tired of hearing me saying, give me the pros and cons. So when they come up with an idea, I say, okay, give me the pros and cons. I'll know why you think it's going to work and then what's, what's the reasons why it may not work or what's some of the dangers of it. Um, I'm, I'm very much not a hands-on, like, in their meddling. I, I give them direction and let them go, and, and then I just wait for the, for the results. Um, maybe a little too much sometimes. I give my staff a little too much rope. But uh, I, you know, I think staff need to make errors. I, I think staff, that's how they learn. Um, and when you have a supervisor going behind the staff and kind of treat them with kit and gloves and make sure they, they don't screw up, I think you're shortchanging your staff. I think they need to screw up. They need to learn. They need to fail. That, that's where we learn is when we fail, we move forward and we build a better product when we learn from our, our mistakes. So I, you know, sometimes I've actually seen staff going down the wrong road and I let them go. And then I let them fail as long as it doesn't sink the ship though. As long as, if it sinks the ship, then I'll, I'll stop it. But as long as it doesn't have too much fallout that I have to deal with afterwards, a lot of times I'll let them screw up and then, then we'll have a teaching moment afterwards and, and figure out, okay, how do we build a better product from, from this, the circumstance. So, uh, again, I'm, I'm, you know, just, I kind of let my, my staff run. Nice. Thanks, Chris. And last but not least, Jason, what's your leadership style? A lot of similarities with what's already been said, but, uh, you know, I want a team environment. I want others to be part of whatever process is being used to come to decisions and set strategy and determine how we're going to go about implementing change. Uh, I would say that I'm, I think of myself as a very hard worker and I have high expectations for myself. So therefore I have high expectations for others. Uh, I've always enjoyed when I've worked for someone that lets me do the job that I've been hired to do. So that same statement is true for those people that work with and under me. I, I've hired them to be a branch executive director. I've hired them to be a chief development officer or a chief financial officer or a program director. So uh, that comes with responsibility. And I want those people that have been hired to do a leadership <clears throat> role to deliver on leadership. So that would be, uh, I'll stop there. Nice. Thank you. And then it was interesting. There was a lot of similarities that everyone had on your leadership style. And then what, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit on you guys. Um, what is the number one aspect that you look for in a trait for all of your employees to have? What is that one trait that you look for in all of your employees before you bring them to the team? I see Chris smiling real big. <laughs> Scott, Scott's going to love this answer. I got this from Jim Ferber. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember I was a program director and, and, and Jim just came on board for Central Florida YMCA. I was working for them at the time. And, and, and he said something. It stuck with me. I look for it now. It's passion. I look for pa passion. You have to have the passion for the job. And if you don't have the passion for the job, I mean, people always say you always train, you, you, you hire personalities and train, create skills. All what you look for is passion. And, and that's the main thing I, I look for. When, when I'm interviewing somebody for a job. Nice. And for those of you who don't know, um, Jim Ferber, how long was he at Central Florida, Chris? What, 13 years? Scott, Scott's going to say too long. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks, Chris. Passion. What about you, Angela? I'm going to say authenticity. I want real people um, that are comfortable with who they are, that love who they are. And if they, they don't love who they are, they're open enough to express that. Um, I just, um, I love authentic people because when you have conversation with real people, you understand where they're coming from. And especially if you're interviewing them and you need to determine if someone is right for your team, if they're very authentic and open and honest, then you'll see really where the heart is and determine if that is really a good fit 
um, at that time for your team of where you're transitioning to. So it allows, authentic people allow me to see a lot. It allows me to see them, but it also allows me to understand where they're at, where they would like to go um, and their comfortability within themselves. Nice, thanks Angela and Jason. I, mine is, uh, I want somebody with a can-do attitude. Our job is going to be difficult at times. We're going to be up against odds that are not in our favor. And I want somebody that's going to approach every situation, uh, every challenge, every opportunity with the attitude of how do we make this work, uh, even when it just seems like there's absolutely no way. And, and that's, uh, that's important to me. And then I... Uh, refuse to quit. We're not always going to win. We're not always going to succeed, but don't stop swinging uh, would be the... Uh, nice. Thanks. And last but not least, Scott Goyer. So all really good answers, and I think probably all go into that. Um, a, a word that I've always liked and it kind of fits with Angela's is genuine. Um, but I think probably uh, confidence uh, and, and not necessarily overconfidence, not with a heavy ego. We all have to have some pretty strong ego strength, but someone is confident. And I think that goes with what Jason was saying as well as candid attitude, but it, it really is, uh, I, I look for uh, genuineness and, and I would say confidence. Nice. So what we heard from was passionate, authentic, can-do attitude, refuse to quit, and confidence, just to keep in everybody's wheelhouse. We do have um, a question from the 94 people that are watching right now. Um, and it's, where do you see the YMCA movement going with a new national CEO coming on board within the next year? <laughs> God. <laughs> well, first I wanna start by saying, I think Jim Ferber is awesome. He did a great job in Central Florida. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, he was there the right amount of time for, for what he was there. And now he lives in St. Pete, so I get to see him occasionally. I, if you're at, you know, I think whoever's going to step into this role as YMCA, the USA CEO, uh, is, is stepping in a unique challenge. And I think that's probably true for everywhere. Uh, they're gonna have to learn to do the work uh, with less resources than what they had because there's a lot of whys that aren't gonna be able to provide the level of resource that was happening before. Um, I think we've got to capture back some, um, some recognition for the kind of work that we're doing in some way, shape, or form. And what I mean by that is what are we being known for? And I think we've lost a little bit of that. Uh, and I think that we've given some of that up over time. And it's not an indictment of any leadership previously. Uh, I think we've got to come back in some way, shape, or form, you know, where there's pendulums that swing. And uh, I think uh, there's going to, I think uh, our, whole, our whole world needs to come back to what I would call centric, kind of that middle kind of space. And I'm not saying that YUSA is done differently, but I think it's, it's uh, you know, we've got to find where people are in the middle. Um, it, it, it is not an enviable role, uh, I will tell you that, because it, you, you want to be able to make decisions that will impact the country in many ways, shape, or form. And you have 800 independent organizations that you've got to get in tow to, to help make that decision. So it's a real, a very, very difficult job. But also one, I think someone has to have understanding of YMCA's are as large as the New York YMCA and YMCA's that are as small as, you know, Maysville, Kentucky. And that is a hard, hard, hard uh, job as well from that standpoint and understand the dynamics that exist between those two, so. You know, that sounds like someone who might be the next YMCA CEO of USA. <laughs> uh, there is something I would and this may not be the right venue. Hell no. <laughs> I have a heart issue. I don't need any of that crap. <laughs> Jason or Angela, would y'all like to chime in? 
tangent I can go, um, while, while I agree with everything Scott was, was sharing, um, I think that the next CEO is going to have to uh, really work on strengthening the local YMCA organizations. I mean, they're, they're at the same time that they're going to be focused on our YMCA movement, which is going to be very important for them to focus on. They're also going to have to, to recognize that of the 790, give or take, associations across the country, some of them are many of them, if not most of them, are struggling like they've never struggled before. So at the same time that we want to focus on cause and community needs at a national level and be part of the conversation on these really, really, really big topics, they're also going to need to navigate the waters that the local YMCAs need to keep the lights on. And that's going to be critically important for us as a movement, us as a state, uh, us as, as, a, as a local YMCA. It's, 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 it's a tough job. Yeah. So Angela, you want to add anything to that? Where do you see the movement going with the new national CEO coming on board next year? Well, I would agree with what everyone was saying as far as looking at um, some of the needs, but we know also on reality is um, it really depends on who they bring on. Um, we hope that, you know, someone that's coming in is going to understand the, the full dynamics of a YMCA. Um, we're a very complicated organization when you dig down into everything that we do. Um, so um, to make sure that we have that right fit that understands our YMCAs, but also understands moving forward um, a lot. What Jason said is, okay, we've gone through this um, national pandemic and we have a lot of whys that need help and they need help now. And what are we gonna do to help those wise continue on into the future. So it's, I, I agree. I do not envy whoever goes for the, this position, um, whoever becomes the new national CEO, but they're, they definitely are gonna have to understand every aspects of this, of the, the movement as a whole in order to transition us into the future of where we need to be. Yeah. Thanks, Angela. Chris? I, I, again, I, I think Scott Gorey would be the best person for that job. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to leave it at that with an exclamation point? Yeah, I, I, I don't have anything else, else to add. I think anyone hit the nail on the head. Um, it's going to be a tough job. It's it's like herding cats or pushing a rope uphill. I mean, use any analogy you want, but trying to deal with a federation of 780, where it was 817, now 780 YMCA Association, unfortunately, it's smaller every day. Um, it's I remember when the current CEO Washington came on board, his big thing was membership, trying, trying to push membership. And it's, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how much impact, honestly, a YMCA USA CEO has directly on each association across the US. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know where we're going, to be honest with you. Uh, we, the business model needs some adjustment. I think we're all as CEOs trying to figure out what is that next business model that will sustain us long term that we can grow and serve our communities and um and i don't i don't know if there's one silver bullet out there that anyone has the answer Again, when you've seen one ymca you've seen one ymca and and everyone's different and trying to find solutions jason well i was just gonna add too i mean at the end of the day it's an incredible position I mean, who else gets to lead an organization that's over 175 years old, that's in, you know, 790 plus uh, communities, and that's only the associations and serving 20 plus million people through programs that touch on every age and demographic. So while we're all saying that it's going to be a difficult position and a difficult role and, and, and a unique individual to fill it, what an awesome opportunity it's going to be for that person to lead the YMC of the USA movement. So keep that in mind too. And I'm not applying for the position and Scott, I'm, keep driving, buddy. <laughs> we've, got, we've got five minutes left. There's two questions. There, there's three actually questions in the chat box from the audience. 
but we like I said, we've only got five minutes left because we end at 550. So if I don't get to all the questions, I'm sorry. But one thing I do want to ask everyone, just we're going to do a quick rip or whip around is one tip you would give a YMCA staff person. One tip. We'll start with Jason. So it's not all about just being good at delivering programs. Uh, you know, to be a leader in the YMCA movement, to grow your career, you have to get good at development. You have to get good at relationships. You have to get good at being a mission-driven, cause-driven communicator. So uh, while delivering programs is important, you got to be good at it. If you want to grow in your career, development, mission, relationships is a prerequisite. Great. Scott? So I'm going to try and limit it to a run on sentence of one. So the first one is surround yourself with good people, get out of their way, let them do their work. Uh, the second I would, in, in, within the con context of that, find something outside of the why. Whatever that something is, find something outside the why. Find friends that are outside the why and say, find an activity outside the why. It's a consuming, consuming world that we live in. And it's one that I'm honored to be able to have done that. Um, and again, I mentioned Devin, I've been married for 36 years and I can't imagine a better partner to be able to move in five different communities with me. But that's somebody who's been a stabilizing force in my life. But I've got friends outside the Y and I would encourage people to find that. Nice. Chris? Uh, I guess for the younger program directors, change jobs. Change departments. Um, learn as much about the YMCA. Volunteer for your campaign, like Jason said. Learn. Uh, fun, fundraising is an acquired taste. Uh, it takes practice. It's not something that someone just falls into and they're not, well, you can be naturally good at it, but it's a very small minority. But volunteer for projects. Uh, tell, tell your supervisor that you know, you're willing to do more. You're willing to learn more. Uh, don't get stuck doing the same job for seven, eight years. Because I think, again, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't, don't be afraid to screw up. Try it, try new things. And I, you know, sometimes they say, you know, you celebrate when you screw up. I don't know, I wouldn't go that far, but try, you know, work in different departments. If you do a sports, work in a quiet. Work quiet, go for the child, child care. Work at summer camp, do the, do the front desk. The more you learn about the YMCA, the better employee, better supervisor you're gonna be down the road. Nice, thanks, Chris. And last but not least, Angela. Um, a lot what, what everyone said, but I'll say one, believe in yourself. Two, be willing to actually step out. And three, learn every, every aspect that you have of that craft that you want to go. Learn everything that you need to and then mix them all together and, and get out there, get your hands in it, learn every parts of it, continue to grow within yourself and then move up. And every time, just keep it going. Just keep it going. Nice. Thank you guys. And I know we, we ended with over a hundred staff on the call. And I know that they love having the ability to hear your response. I apologize for the two questions that we didn't get to. Um, one was on diversity and inclusion, which was when one of the, the um, questions I put forth to the CEOs to, to answer. And the other one was about the, our virtual presence as being a leader in the movement. So just to let you know, uh, we did run out of time. We have one minute left, but I really want to sincerely thank you as CEOs for giving your time now and then on the daily basis that you give to your staff and developing and coaching and, and really investing in our future leaders. So thank you very much. Thanks to everyone who attended. I um, hope it was beneficial. I think it was. Thanks for your honesty, CEOs, and your authenticity. Angela, to use your word. So Thank you guys, have a great day. Be safe out there, Scott driving. Thanks for everyone who attended. Bye guys. Have a good day. Bye.